Like Josh said, my name is uh, Morgan Burns. I'm a pastor uh, here in town, City Life Church. So I grew up in Wichita. Wichita is home for me. Um, I live just down at 13th and Hillside, so this is pretty much my neighborhood in a lot of ways. Um, I'm here with my wife, Kelsey, and she's right here in the second row, my beautiful wife, Kelsey. And then our new, uh, I don't know if we call her newborn anymore, but she's five months old. Her name's Mariah, and so uh, they're both here with me this morning. I'm thankful for them. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20. We're going to look at one of Jesus' parables. And, and it's important that when we look at Jesus' parable, that word parable, in the Greek it means, uh, I think it's parabole. And to understand, it's, it's important to understand that, compa- that par- parables is a comparison. This is like this. So a lot of people look at parables and think they're like uh, allegories, which means we have to look at the details. Now, what, what does this represent? What, what does this little minute detail represent? We can get caught up in the details. But looking at Jesus' parables, he usually makes comparison to the kingdom of God. And so as a pastor, my desire for my people at City Life Church and for myself is that we would become disciples of Jesus Christ, students, that we would follow him. Or like my mentor Vic Gordon says, I mean, how can we follow him Be like Jesus unless we know what he said and what he taught. So the main theme of Jesus' teaching and preaching is the kingdom of God. If you look at Matthew 4, 17, it says that from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or Matthew 4, 23, it says that Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I could go verse by verse throughout the Gospels looking at different verses and how Jesus is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. But it's important to understand that when you hear the word kingdom, some of you may think that the kingdom of God is a place or it's a realm or maybe it's a group of people. That's how you've been raised to think. That the kingdom of God is something that you can grow, thus making us the center of the kingdom. Or maybe that it's this distant place that you go to when we die. So when you see the kingdom of God in Scripture, when you hear Jesus preaching and teaching the good news of the kingdom, it means the rule and the reign of God. It's something God does. He actively rules and reigns. Now hear me. God has always ruled and reigned over everything. But when Jesus said the kingdom of God is here, we see that the rule, the reign of God, the kingdom, has been brought here on earth through the person of Jesus Christ, through his birth, his teachings, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension to the Father. Jesus has ushered in the kingdom here on earth. And I love it. Through the kingdom, he has given us this beautiful, powerful gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, through the Holy Spirit, God primarily manifests the kingdom through his people, the church. Now, this is just a brief snapshot of the now of the kingdom, and there's so much more. So that's the now of the kingdom. Let's talk a little bit about the not yet of the kingdom. The not yet of the kingdom is that God is working to bring all things fully Under his reign and rule, at the second coming of Jesus, the consummation of the kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth, where we will praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We will be in perfect relationship with the Father, and I love this, perfect relationship with each other. No matter the ethnic or cultural boundaries, (laughs) that's beautiful. Now, as we look at the parable, as we look at Jesus, the greatest storyteller of all time, he uses parables to shed light on the truths of the kingdom. So you will see multiple times in Scripture that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like, and then Jesus will begin to teach and tell a parable, making one to maybe two or three points. So this brings us, that's my introduction, this brings us to to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, I'm going to read it for us. Uh, and this is how we do at City Life Church. If you please stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied uh, to the one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last would be first and the first last. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Now, let, let me pray before I, I dive in uh, to this text. Uh, Father, uh, I just acknowledge that you are a good and holy and merciful God. For you are a good, good Father. Now, I just pray that uh, you would just speak through me, through your spirit. That would not be my words, but it would be your words, and that uh, my job is to get the words to the ears. Father, I just ask you to get uh, the word from their ears to their hearts. Father, you would penetrate their hearts, renew their minds, and transform them to look more like your son Jesus. So, Lord, be with us this morning. Help us uh, uh, to grow closer to you, to give us understanding to your word. Jesus and I pray, amen. Amen. So at City Life Church, those who know me really well know that a few things. I have have two brothers. One of the brothers is is here. He's actually, I invited him. I have two brothers and a sister. We're very, very competitive. So I grew up playing every sport under the sun, basketball, football, I played some soccer, baseball, ran track. Very competitive family. Our schedules revolved around sports. Very competitive. As a matter of fact, on the 4th of July, people would ask me, how was your 4th? I would say, ah, it's pretty typical. Hung out with my family. We got into some intense, pointless debates. We, We played an intense game of charades that got way too serious to the point that someone's feelings got hurt. And it ended in a tie. And get this. My dad had the nerve to say, it's just for fun, let's end in a tie. (laughs) Me and my siblings looked at my father as if we were going to jump him and throw him out the house. So we're very competitive. Something else that's important to know if you're going to spend time with my family is more times than not, uh, we're going to have a dance party. We're going to to dance. Whether there's music or not, we're going to dance some way, shape, or form. You know, Justin Timberlake, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Bruno Mars, 80s music, hip-hop country, you name it, we'll dance to it. You name it, we'll dance to it. And so a musical artist that played a huge uh, role in my childhood is the king of pop, Michael Jackson. Arguably one of the greatest performers and talents of all time. And it's interesting, a person that played a huge role in molding uh, him into the performer that he was, was his father, Joseph Jackson. Now, legend has it that Joseph would come home to his house in Gary, Indiana, and, and he would push all the furniture in the living room to the ends of the room, creating space and demanding Michael and his brothers to perform. Now, practicing the dance steps until it was perfect, this is, this is interesting. And if for some reason, 
they messed up, Joseph would take a belt, beating them mercilessly. So how did this turn out? Joseph Jackson's methods, well, you could say he got what he wanted. One of the greatest performers of all time. However, there's a dark side to these demanding methods that, that while uh, his child could do the steps throughout the process and Michael doing the steps, he lost the connection with his dad. As a matter of fact, if, if Michael were to get interviewed about, about his father, Joseph Jackson, he wouldn't even refer to him, to his own father, as father. He wouldn't refer to his own dad as dad, but he called him Joseph. Here's a man who learned how to do the steps, but in the process of doing the steps, like I said, he lost the connection with his dad. You see, the problem with many church folk is we learn to do the steps, we learn to perform, but we lose the connection with our father. We lose the connection with our father. What tends to happen after we get saved is somewhere down the line, we reduce Christianity to matters of performance, doing the right steps. We start operating and functioning as if our merit, what we do, determines how much God loves us and if he's going to bless us or not. Sometimes we get spiritual amnesia. We forget that what got us into the kingdom grace is the same thing that keeps us in the kingdom grace. Now this brings us to the backdrop of why Jesus is telling this parable. So if you look in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, we see that Jesus has this encounter with this man. And what we know about this man from Scripture is that he is rich, he has a lot of money, he's young. In Luke 18, it calls him a ruler, the rich young ruler. So we see that he has some social authority, power, and influence. So he, he's rich, he has youth, he has power, and on top of all of these, we see that he's moral. Man, if there, if there was a picture of someone who, who should be satisfied, man, this is it, right? This is it. But this man comes to Jesus with this question, which should, which should raise some red flags if you're deeply rooted in the gospel. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. And he says, which ones? He says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. The rich young man says, well, I've kept all of these since I was a child. Bold claim. And he says, what, what do I still lack? Finally, Jesus says, if you want true life, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. What happens? The man walks away sad, for he realizes that you can't serve two masters in the kingdom of God. We have this picture of this man who comes to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Already we see this man is focusing on his works and what he can do to earn and deserve this eternal life. I'm rich. I'm young. I have power. I tithe. Man, I'm nice to people. I love my wife. I don't steal. As a matter of fact, I serve at the local synagogue. And I love it. Jesus just takes his legs out from under him. This man was focused on his works, what he had done. Jesus redirects the conversation for what must he do to his heart. Jesus points to the fact that he is not on the throne of this man's life and the fact that his heart is far from him. His heart is far from him. That, that, that where your treasure is, your heart will also be. So it's, it's easy to see that this man does not treasure Jesus overall. And I love in verse 25, the, 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 the disciples are shocked. Man, if this brother can't be saved, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? Verse 26, I love Jesus' response. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. A church member once asked a great Martin Luther, man, Martin Luther, why are you always preaching on the gospel week in and week out? Uh, why are you always preaching on the gospel? I love his response. 
He's like, I'm always preaching on the gospel week in and week out because week in and week out, you are constantly forgetting the gospel. So like Luther, I want to remind you of the gospel. Rep it in your heads and your hearts that we are not saved by works. For it is by grace you have been saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. This was the point to Jesus' response that it is impossible for this rich, young, successful, moral man to save himself. But with God's grace, it's possible. So there should be no chest beating in the kingdom of God. No, look at what I did. No showing others our our, our spiritual highlight reels. This brings us to the parable in Matthew chapter 20. The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to look for workers. Now, as we look at this parable, you you don't see this much, uh, these workers going out to to, to look for work. But it was very common in this day for laborers to, to, to wait to be picked up for jobs. And I even know in different parts of the world, uh, this is still a common practice. So we'll see at this master, he goes out early in the morning, maybe 6 a.m. Any, any early morning people here? Any? No? All right. Maybe two people. All right. Praise God. And the master, we see at this master goes out early and he hires these first group of workers. And he does so in a very straightforward manner. Look at verse 2. It says, the master agreed with the workers to pay them a denarius for a day's work. Now, it's important to understand that a denarius was a standard day's wage back then. It was, it was very fair. It, it was typical. And, and it would usually cover what one needed for the day. So this is a, t- a total normal arrangement for this, for this day, for this time. And then we see in the third hour, which is about 9 a.m., the master goes back out and sees other workers just standing in the marketplace. In verse 4, he tells them to go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. He doesn't tell them how much he's going to pay them. He just says, come with me, and I'll give you what is right. So we see that these workers, they come completely on trust. He does this again at the sixth hour, which is about noon, and then the ninth hour, which is about 3 p.m., and lastly, the eleventh hour, which is 5 p.m., And this is important to understand because at 5 p.m. was about an hour before quitting time, which is 6 p.m. So they all go with the master by faith, trusting, believing in his promise to take good care of them. And I love it. 6 p.m. rolls around. They blow the whistle. It's time to get paid. Man, I hear that whistle. (laughs) I'm running. It's time to get paid. It's interesting. Because we look at verse 8, and the master does something a little odd. He starts paying the last guys first. The master had to know that this would raise some eyebrows. It would stir some emotions. Man, I look at this parable, I'm just like, man, if he would have just paid the early workers first, those who worked the full 12 hours he probably would have saved himself a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. But he insists on paying the last guys first. I think this is intentional. I think Jesus is trying to make a point here. So look at the parable. They're all in line. The master gets his bag of coins. All right, 5 p.m., guys, where are you at? Where are you at? They step forward. Energetic, smell nice, no sweat marks, no pit stains. The master says, I told you I'd take care of you. Here's a denarius for you, denarius for you, a denarius for you. So the workers who have been working all day are at the end of the line. They see what's going on. They start getting excited. They see if the master pays the 5 p.m. folk for a fool's day's work, a denarius, when they only worked one hour. So they're like, whoa, that's crazy generous. That means I'll be getting, they start doing the math based on their logic. That means 
I'm going to get paid a lot. <laughs> Finally, he gets to, the, to, to, to the, those who work uh, the third hour. They step forward, they get a denarius. And then the six-hour folk step forward, get a denarius. The nine-hour folk step forward, get a denarius. And they each get paid a denarius. Finally, he gets to the people who work the full 12 hours, and here's where it gets, I'm going to warn you, offensive. And a denarius for you. Hold up, wait a minute. In the words of the people all across America, that's not fair. That's not fair. Look at verse 10 through 12. Now, when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. I love that. You, you made them equal to us. Let me just say a quick word about making them equal. When you start functioning out of merit-based faith, you start thinking you're better than other people. You start thinking you're better than other people. And let me tell you this, this is how hierarchies are formed. That's, this is how my preference is more important is formed. This is why you don't pursue relationships with people who maybe have a different story than you, or maybe they're different ethnically, culturally, or economically. Or maybe while you're not in community with someone who came to faith at a different time or place than you. And this takes me back to Acts chapter 10. I love that this is a multi ethnic church and that you're pursuing multi ethnic ministry, because I could talk all day about that. It takes me back to Acts chapter 10, where Peter and Cornelius, this Gentile, they had this encounter where, where, where Peter goes across the train tracks, hanging out with these Gentiles. He shares the gospel. We see that the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentiles. And Peter says, I understand that God shows no favoritism to any group of people. So my question is, if you're an early morning worker in this parable, you've been following Christ, you've been in the church for a long time, my question is, how do we welcome, love, and embrace 11th hour type of people? How do we love, embrace 11th hour type of people? The one who has a different story, came to faith later, doesn't have the quote-unquote spiritual resume that you have. Looking back at the early worker, we see that he's grumbling at the master. We see that so there's some entitlement starting to creep in. We see the earlier workers uh, are starting to play this comparison game, pulling out scorecards. I've been here 12 hours compared to this one who's been here for one hour. I've been working all day. Look at my blood, sweat, and tears. I even think there's some similarity here to the parable of the prodigal son, to the older brother in the parable. You see, the older brother is upset with his father for showing his younger son grace. He points back out of anger and bitterness to all of the work he had done and feeling like he deserves something. Because this is how we operate in a wage-based and merit-based world. Our sense of justice that gives us order and control, that's not fair. I mean, we live in, this is Kansas, correct? Kansas, the Midwest, pull yourself up by your bootstraps type of people. Go work all those hours to, to do earn, to deserve the, the, the job, to get on the team. So what Jesus is pointing to in this parable is totally upside down without understanding of the way the world works. Totally upside down. You know, it's interesting, in a recent a relevant magazine article, there was an article pointing to millennials and how they define success. So I'm just going to preface this, but I think it's more than just millennials. It says that our generation, how we define success is in three ways. It says our generation values performance. 
That's how we measure things. Second, our generation values position. We, like, we love the title. And then thirdly, our generation values power. We like control. So performance, position, and power. Now, I think that these three values, I think, have easily seeped into the way the church operates and functions. Performance, position, and power. And so, church, as Christ followers, this parable, I'm going to say it again, this parable points to Jesus' upside-down kingdom. His upside-down kingdom. Everything goes against our fair wage-based worldview in the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom, hear me out, where God reigns. Where if you want to be great, you are servants. Where offenders are forgiven time after time. Where suffering, get this, leads to glory. Where enemies are loved and prayed for, where humility is exalted, where Jew and Gentile exist in the same family. And where favor, get this, where favor isn't given because of merit, but on a basis of grace. So we see that kingdom culture usually always contradicts. Kingdom culture contradicts. So my view is this is why he ends this parable in verse 16 So the last will be first, and the first last. Because in our minds, when you're first, that means you're first, correct? And in my family, if you're last, that means you're dead last. So God doesn't operate on our same scale of fairness. His gifts are far beyond what anyone deserves. So if we just sit here and just reflect And think about all the undeserved gifts that God has given you. Just reflect on all. I I could sit here and just ramble all day about all the gifts God has given me that I do not deserve. So first point, parable points to Jesus' upside-down kingdom. Second, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of unexpected grace and generosity. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of unexpected grace and generosity. And generosity. One commentator says it this way There's only been one person in all of history that has lived his entire life perfectly, always deferring to the will of his father and to the needs of others. He never achieved any status or riches in his lifetime, but was willing to live in poverty and to be ridiculed and shame, to die between two thieves pouring himself out completely out as a gift of salvation for us. The 12 disciples who had been asking what kind of reward they would receive for following him hid in shame while he was being crucified. Only when Jesus rose from the dead and they realized what he had done for them did his disciples stop worrying about fairness and receiving special honor. They realized that they had received unreasonable generosity. So it was unexpected grace and generosity that moved the father and the prodigal son to his younger son, embracing him with compassion, throwing him a party, giving him the best robe and the ring on his finger. It was unexpected generosity and grace that compelled the king in Matthew 18 to to release his servant of his debt of 10,000 talents. And it was unexpected grace and generosity at the heart of the master paying the last workers first, giving them a full day's pay for only one hour. So this is grace. This is grace. If you didn't know, grace is getting what you did not deserve. Grace fundamentally is unmerited favor. Matt Chandler says it this way, grace is not eating your dinner but still getting dessert. I mean, I love that. <laughs> or it's when your parents, parents, you... You get that phone call about your kid at school that got in trouble. You go and pick them up, and instead of giving them a, maybe a whooping, you, y'all may give whoopings anymore. I got whoopings. Instead of giving them a whooping, you pick them up from school, go to their favorite restaurant, go get ice cream, and go to Best Buy to get them the new iPhone. Whew. 
Grace is scandalous. Grace is shocking. Grace always raises eyebrows. It insults our intelligence. And I want you to hear me out. Don't hear me wrong. Grace is not an opposition to effort. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.10. Paul writes, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So we see, we see grace fundamentally transforms. And Paul, Paul's not operating, he's not working hard to be accepted. He's not working hard to earn. He's working hard because he is accepted. So grace fundamentally transforms. God is not opposed to effort, but he is opposed to earning. So here we are. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of unexpected grace and generosity. So as we get to the end of our story, the master deals with the early fairness-based workers with a couple of questions. I just love imagining these early workers um, and that, man, they are just hurt right now. They're hurt to the core. You mean to tell me you paid them the same amount you paid us? That we're equal? I've been grinding all day in the heat. They start pointing back to what they have done. And if I can speak honestly, I think there are times where Christians, church folk, and we start keeping lists. We start keeping lists. Man, I've been to church uh, three times this month. I'm in at least two to three different ministries serving. Uh, I've been a part of this church for years and years. I'm in a community group. And now if you're doing these things, I don't want to knock them. Praise God. But when our motivation to do these things come out of those three things I mentioned, that, that you need to get your performance up to look good for God and others, or, or to make a certain rank or status within the church seeking power or position where you think you're better than someone sitting on your row. To the point that when someone else gets an opportunity or blessed by the Lord, man, you get a little angry. You get a little bitter. What, what's she doing up on stage? Then, brother and sister, if this is you, man, I think I need to call you and myself because I'm at the front of the line to repent, to repentance. Look at verse 13. The master says, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? So in these last couple of questions, we get a beautiful glimpse of God's character. The master says, have I not given to you what was promised? Have I not been faithful on my end? I've been generous. Have I not been good? So we see faithfulness. We see goodness. We see generosity. Wow. Verse 15. Am I not allowed to do what I choose, what belongs to me? You may not know this, but... God is allowed to bless and extend generosity however, whenever, and to whomever he chooses. And he doesn't need, and you may not know this either, he does not need our stamp of approval to do so. And he is in debt to no one. He's in debt to no one. God's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And then again in verse 15, the master says, do you begrudge my generosity? And I think in the footnote of your Bible, it should say at the bottom of the footnote for that verse, um, are your eyes bad because I am good? Is your eye, your eye bad because I am good? So we see the Father's goodness but we see the heart of the early workers exposed, that their eyes and focus are not on how graceful and generous the Father has been to them, but on what they think they deserve from God. What they think they deserve from God. J.D. Greer, a pastor on the East Coast, has a, has a, has a few signs 
to show that if you're operating out of this entitled, wage-based mindset, and here are his five signs. It should be up on the screen. First is bitterness. You are bitter because God has withheld some blessing from you you think you deserve. Second, jealousy. You are jealous of good things others have that you want. Third, anger. You get angry when God doesn't answer your prayers the way you think they should be answered. Four, you're insecure. You feel as if you haven't been good enough to earn God's blessing. So you operate out of insecurity. Does God love me? Does he love me because of what I'm doing? Then fifth, you're calloused. You have a calloused heart. You don't have sympathy toward those who are suffering because, get this, you think they're getting what they deserve. So I just want to point to these five uh, 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 signs, and if any of these resonate with you or an emotion you feel often, man, then I encourage you to take these and run to the character of God. I love it in the Psalms when David, he always pours his emotions and heart out to God. God, why are you doing it this way? God, I'm so angry. Why, God? But more times than not, he always ends coming back to the character of God. So I encourage you, if you feel bitterness, jealousy, anger, insecurity, if you're calloused, to embrace the grace of God, to trust in his goodness. And get this, when you embrace the the grace of God and trust in his goodness, this is what happens. That bitterness will be replaced with gratitude. Jealousy will, will be replaced with contentment. Anger with peace. Insecurity with assurance. That callous heart would turn into a heart of compassion. Now, I praise God because everything, every good thing I've received is a gift of grace from the Father. Every good thing we have received is a gift of grace from the Father. I could stop here and go into a sermon on generosity just because of that. I mean, just look at the blessings of our salvation. We have been justified because of grace. We are being sanctified because of his grace. And I love this. We will be glorified because of his grace. So in a nutshell, if we look at this parable, this is a picture of a master by grace initiating towards hiring allowing these workers to be a part of his plan, and then blessing them. Likewise, God has initiated towards us through the incarnation of Jesus, that Jesus lived the perfect, obedient life, get this, treated unfairly and unjust, yet he did not complain or begrudge the Father. And upon the cross, getting what we deserve, we see his beautiful picture Jesus being crucified, interacting with these criminals onto his left and to his right. The first criminal mocking him, are you not the Christ? Save yourself. But the second criminal rebukes him, speaking truth. Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, But this man has done nothing wrong. You see, this criminal saw that he rightfully deserved death and suffering. He said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here's the punchline. Here's the unexpected grace and generosity that should rock you to your core. Jesus says, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't deserve it. Much like the 11th hour workers, he's a criminal. This is upside down. This is grace. This is generosity. This is kindness. This is our God of the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, I just want to lift you up that you are a holy, good, generous, graceful God. 
Father, I pray for any hearts in here this morning that, that, that have bitterness, jealousy, anger. They're calloused. Lord, that we would just sit under the waterfall of your grace and your kindness. That you begin to transform and to penetrate our hearts. That we would see that you uh, are graceful and generous to us. And that the way things are in your kingdom upside down to our, our way of thinking. So would you renew our minds? Help us to have the mind of Christ like Paul says in Philippians, to have the mind of Christ, that we put others' needs before our own, that the Bridge Church will be a place of grace and generosity because you are. So Lord, I thank you and I praise you. I pray that this word would be for the edification of this body. Jesus, I pray. Amen.